Dr. Andre Pinesa here, and today we are continuing our discussion of systemic racism in higher education and education in general. And today we advance from junior high to high school, guys. Junior high to high school. And today, right, the words are you are not a real black person. You are not a real black person. Who has heard that? Right? Who has said that? If you're on the opposite side of it, but it feels terrible. We're gonna talk about today the non-real, right? The fake black person. Let's talk about it, y'all. But stop making excuses, stop whining, stop, right? Get at it. No excuses, just dominate. Just wanna keep it real, right? Everybody wants to keep it real, but how do we keep it real as a black person? That's what we're talking about today, guys. I'm Dr. Pine said I'm the study doc. As always, trying to bring positivity, trying to bring productivity, helping students be their best, Helping pre meds be the best. I hope you reach all their ultimate goals, including being successful students and getting into medical school. What is up, guys? Meryl, Utham, Surig, I can't read your username, Kasim Yusuf, Jonathan Noel, what's up? So, we are continuing our discussion, guys. We are live all week. We are live action right now. Albert, hello. Carla, hello. Uh, finally caught me live, Albert. I'm glad you're on here. Um, we are talking about race in America, right? Recently, racism and discrimination has been pushed to the forefront, right? With that brutal murder, in pu right? public daylight murder, nine minutes on the back of the neck of George Floyd, but many other incidents. And what we are trying to do this week is to spotlight that as minorities in America, particularly as blacks in America, it is a different experience. And there are systemic factors that make being a black person or a person of color in America in general, but particularly as students of color, it is a unique and a different and a challenging experience and today's words and i think every single day what i'm bringing to you guys is not necessarily the words that are said because a lot of times right racism and discrimination is kind of covert is kind of subtle it's right these microaggressions it's not necessarily what was said but it's what is felt right and yesterday it was my black skin intimidating my teacher right the look of my black face was intimidating and threatening to my teacher and today we advanced to high school and if you guys don't know, I grew up in Orange County. I went to Newport Harbor High School, right, home of the Sailors. And if you guys know nothing about Newport Beach, it is one of the wealthiest, most Republican uh, cities in America. Very wealthy, very Republican, very conservative. And at this high school of 2,500 students, I think we had like 2,400 some change students, there were, count them, three black people in the entire high school. Three. 2,500 students, three black people. I think that's like 1%. It's terrible. Three black people, less than 1%. And... The rest of the school was split, half Hispanic, half white. And <laughs> I went through this high school being one of the few black faces, and it was an interesting and a, and a kind of, I think that it's it's what's given me in a, such a, uh, I think a unique insight, a unique perspective into racism and discrimination and race relations in education in America, because I was one of three black people in a sea of 2,400 people, half of which were lower income, Hispanics, Mexicans, Latino, whatever you want to call it, right, brown people. And then half the school was wealthier white people. And that was the division, right? And the Hispanic crowd had the tables, the white crowd had the bricks. That's how it fit. And the black people just kind of existed wherever they existed, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. Yeah, so people get conservative, posted here, right? But so that's how the school was divided. So I could see the interplay of the sea of all these people. And what I found very interesting was that as you guys, right, I'm a physician, right? I'm an anesthesiologist. I've always been serious about academics. I've always been someone who tried to put my best foot forward. And for many of you guys, right, as a minority, when you're surrounded by people who are not like you, you try to fit in. You try, you feel that pressure as we talked about last time, right? That pressure of being the only black person, the only minority. And so you guys, we, we go through this process of feeling that pressure of we're the only one. And we feel all the pressure to be perfect and to succeed. And so you try to do your best. And for a long time, right, I felt this growing up, right, in the predominantly white community, I wanted to be my best. And so I always tried to show them, right, how smart I was, how intelligent I was, how capable I was. And so I would put my best foot forward. And as part of that, in this process of going through high school, and marching the process, <laughs> somewhere in my journey in high school, in the second half of my high school, 
someone came to me one day and they were telling a story about an encounter they had had with a black person. And the story was flagrantly racist. Yeah, I just saw your text, Kasim. Yeah, so I'm going to read your story in a little bit. Uh, if you guys have not already, you guys can send me your stories. Uh, Kasim has my number. But you guys can send me an email. Get to my website, right, at studenttransformation.com. Get on my contact page. Send me a message. And let me know what your stories are dealing with racism, discrimination, in higher education. So we can talk about it, right? This is a discussion for all of you guys. One tall girl finally catch me live. What up, Shelby? Hello, Taylor, hello, right? So someone says to me, they tell this incredibly racist story about this black person, how ghetto they're acting, and it's very derogatory. And so I say to this girl, and I say, hey, listen, you know, that's really an offensive story. It's really racist, what you were saying. Racist how? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, because you're describing black people and the way you're talking about it, it's very offensive to me as a black person. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, well, you're not a real black person. And I say, what do you mean I'm not a real black person? What does that mean? And she goes, oh, well, you know, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't know. What do you mean I'm not a real black person? And she goes on to explain that I talk proper. My pants don't hang off my butt. I'm going to school. I live in Newport. And she's listing off all these things that are synonymous, right, with success, with being together, with having aspirations. And she's ascribing that black people are the opposite of that, right? Slovenly dressed, not go-getters, lazy, poorly spoken, all of these things that she's ascribing to make black people inferior. And you can imagine, right, surrounded by white people, what do you say to that? And this is interesting. Carla knows this story. Like, I talk to my student group about it all the time, right, because I'm trying to create community in my student group, our cult of greatness. So we talk about issues like this. This is something that's real, and it happens. And so what this prompted me to do was this, this girl <laughs> was actually on ASB, right, the Associated Student Body, whatever it stands for in high school, and was one of the school leaders. And the group of people around were also on ASB. And so it really got my goat, and I was pretty angry about it. So <laughs> I decided that I was going to shift and change some things up. And before I get to what happened, when discrimination happens, when racism happens, when things like this happen, what is your guys' tendency? So for my students of color, if you were in this scenario and someone made you feel less than, someone was being very racist, right, towards your culture, towards your people and was indirectly insulting you. You're not a real black person. How does it make you feel? What do you think? What do you do? What is your reaction to their actions, to their words? And thank you guys all who are commenting right now and sharing. We're gonna pull all this stuff up and we're gonna talk about it. This is a discussion. We're all here to discuss this, right? This is about educating, it's about opening up those channels to let people understand what that experience is. So for you guys who have experienced similar situations where you were involved with someone being racist, someone being derogatory towards the group you identify with, towards you, how does it make you feel? Right? And I see it here, it's awful. You don't feel, you feel awful, you feel terrible, you feel less than, you feel, right, unwanted. You feel like you don't belong and what do you wanna do? You wanna withdraw. You want to go back into yourself. You want to pull away from what they're doing. And this is what happens in higher education, right? One tall girl just says, I get silent because I never know what to say, right? So what, what do you even say to that? You're surrounded by a group of people who all laugh and all think it's funny, right? It's hysterical. You're not a real black person. You know, you're not ghetto. Oh. And it's hysterical, but you're like, that's not funny to me. What do you do? And we recoil, right? We go inside our shell. We feel uncomfortable and we miss out on opportunities. We experience loneliness. We don't have the connection. We don't have the support. Because when things go wrong in academics, which they do, right? School is hard. Sometimes you don't get the A. And you want to have a shoulder, someone to go to and say, man, I messed up. Things didn't go well. But as a minority, you're not afforded that opportunity. Because if you go to them and say, man, I really messed that up. And I really need someone to tell this to, you're worried they're going to judge you. Right? And you are going to become that stereotype they have for what a black person is. And you don't want to embody that negative stereotype. So you keep it all inside. And how many of you guys as minorities feel like you have to keep your, right, your soft underbelly? You have to keep your shortcomings. You have to keep your struggles. You have to keep your anguish inside. And you let it eat at you and tear away at you and pull away your focus and make academic environment a negative environment. Right? That's what we do. 
And again, as you guys can hear through all these stories, my parents have always been a beacon of centering me. And what my parents always explain to me is it's not about black, it's not about white, it's not about anything, it's about excellence. And if you want to shut people up and you want people to treat you differently, the way you do it is not by yelling, it's not by getting angry, it's not by firing back, and it's not by going into a shell, it's by being so excellent, so great, that all they can do is acknowledge your greatness. All they can do is see your greatness and be in awe. And so like I said, these girls were all in student government. So I said, you know what? I got you, I got you. And I ran for senior class president the next year. And in the history of the school, there had never been a black senior class president. There had never been a minority senior class president. And in fact, 90% of the ASB and all of the elected positions at the time were white. So ASB elections are coming, right? And people put up posters, doing all that stuff. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm just on the ballot. And everything's a big joke. And I'm running against this girl who is was sophomore class president, junior class president, and is now going to be senior class president, right? Got it all. And I'm running against her. And they're like, why is this guy running against her? Oh, my gosh, of course she's going to win. And they were mocking my campaign. I didn't put up any posters. None of that. Got time for speech time. <laughs> what do you want to represent if you're elected ASB? And she got up. She gave this whole speech about how she was going to serve the student bodies and get more on-campus parking and all that kind of stuff going on, right? She gives her speech. They hand me the microphone. And I said, hey, listen, I'm running because I want to change the face of our student body. I said, when you look around right now, half this school are students of color. And I said, if you vote for me, it's because you want more color. And I said, right now, right, we are not represented equally. And I said, all of, <laughs> all of my students of color, vote for me, make your vote count, make our voice heard because I'll represent us, the students of color. And it was, and I'm watering it down a little bit for you guys, right? Giving you guys the filter version, but it was something to that raw effect. It was all about race. And it was about representation, and about things being equal. And it was about feeling a part of the community and about having, right, being acknowledged and being treated, right, appropriately in the environment. And the administrator of the school, like, pulled me aside and I'm like, why was it inappropriate to say? I'm like, why is it inappropriate to say? She got to talk about parking. Why can't I talk about what I'm really passionate about, what I'm running for? It's the only reason I'm running is to talk about those things. So this all happens, and then I don't get to speak at the second assembly. <laughs> so there was two assemblies, right? The whole school couldn't fit one gym. So there was two assemblies. I didn't get to speak at the second one because I violated in the first one. Election day comes, and everyone's thinking I'm not going to win. I won. And when I won the election, it was such a shock because, again, this girl's incumbent two years in a row. This girl's supposed to win. All this stuff's going down. When I won, there was such a shock about it, they actually had a revote. Because like, there's no way this guy won the vote, revote. And what was amazing was the second revote, I actually got more votes, won by a larger margin than the first time. And from that position, I was able to make moves in ASB to change policies, to do different things. And one of the things that came up, it was actually kind of fortuitous, right? The first dance of the year, what should our theme be? And I'm in this ASB meeting and they're like, oh, you know what we should do? I know what we should do. And this is, again, I'm old guys, it's early 2000s, right? This is Nelly, right? This is that time. And they're like, oh, you know what we should do? We should do a ghetto hoedown. That'll be a fun dance theme, a ghetto hoedown. You know, we'll get fake chains and we'll get baseball jerseys and we'll get big baggy pants with the belt buckles, get some Air Force Ones. And they were like making a mockery, like bandanas and headbands. They're making a mockery, do rags, making a mockery. Oh, we get braids and they're making a mockery, right, of what they perceived to be ghetto culture, which was really, right, how black people were dressing at that time. Right? Those were popular, right? Everybody had a, everybody had a FUBU jersey, right? I know I had a FUBU jersey, I had a velour sweatsuit, I was ready, right? But they were mocking this, and they were going to dress up like this, almost like dressing up in what? Blackface. I thought that was the equivalent. So I was like, no, this is highly inappropriate, and so I put the whole veto to that, right? But that is the whole example, guys, of how in an environment, that's not easy to do. And I sell this story not because of what I did, 
but understanding that that's becoming senior class president, right? If you were to see that on someone's resume, you're like, oh, senior class president is not really impressive. But if you look at the distance travel, which is what miss is miss, right? So someone after yesterday's video, someone was like, wrote a comment that essentially said, well, I thought getting into medical school was easier for black students, easier. And what people don't recognize about that data when we talk about matriculation to medical school, that yes, it is absolutely a fact that black students on average have lower MCAT and GPA scores than the rest of the ethnicities. That is true. But the issue that people are missing is that their acceptance is not because they're necessarily black, but because of all the things that come along with being black and what they've had to go through to achieve that GPA. And if you are a black man or a black woman, right, or a minority of another ethnicity, and you're coming from this background and at every single level of your education, you're facing opposition, you're facing discrimination, you're losing out on opportunities because people see the color of your skin, then every single thing you achieve is that much harder. And everything that you actually are able to achieve through all the storm of the chaos is that much more impressive. And it's the distance traveled and the terrain you've traveled. And for certain students getting a, a 3.3 MCAT score, getting a 505 MCAT score, sorry, 3.3 GPA, a 505 MCAT score, getting, graduating, it may not seem like much to you guys, but a 3.3, when you've had no tutoring, when your teachers have mistreated you, when your classmates have mistreated you, have made you feel like you don't belong, that's much more impressive than when you have a tutor every day after school. And make no mistake about it, in these rich communities, Newport Beach, every student has not just a little bit of tutoring. I'm talking about hours and hours of tutoring. I know because I had a tutoring company where I was tutoring these kids. And so what you guys have to understand is this is what we're talking about, is these little things that imagine in an ASB meeting, it's an official school environment. There's, there's teachers in the classroom. The quorum of ASB wants to have a ghetto hoedown. The reason I know Nelly was, Nelly was popping at this time is because I kid you not, I'm just playing it out. I'm letting it play out. I'm watching what's happening so I can smack it down. They literally turned on, do you guys remember Midwest slang? This is like for St. Lun Lunatic. This is, this is really old for some of you young people. I want you guys to look it up today. Midwest slang. It's Nelly and the St. Lunatics. And it's like on the B side of like one of those Nelly songs. And they turn on Midwest slang. Midwest slang. And they're walking around the thing, Midwest swing. And they're walking around the classroom. I'll never forget it. It was like a parade, Midwest swing. And I was just like, are you guys out of your rocket science minds? Like, come on, guys. we got to be better than this. And I laid out all the points of why that was inappropriate and why that would make people feel bad. And what was cool about it, I think it was kind of like an after effect, was afterward, right? I said there was no elected officials on ASB. But that year, there were actually quite a few class representatives who were Hispanic. Right? There's no black people Hispanic. <laughs> And they were like, oh, thank you so much for saying that. That was so blah, blah, blah. I, I felt uncomfortable. And it's that uncomfortable feeling, right, at every single level of education that creates a problem. And as Carla's pointing out, guys, we have to, as students of color, the message of this week is not that discrimination is insurmountable. It's not that racism is insurmountable. To beat racism, to beat discrimination, to knock down systemic racism and systemic discrimination, what we have to do, and someone sent me a message saying that when I use terms like equality and equity in education, that I'm using terms that are empty. And what people are missing the boat on, right? People don't read between the lines. When I say equality, when I say equity, when I say equitable experiences, I'm saying that all students should have the opportunity the same opportunities, the same support across the board. Equity and equality and diversity and inclusion are empty words because no one is actioning that. It's like how people talk about, oh, I'm not racist versus being anti-racist. A lot of schools, a lot of people say, I support diversity and inclusion but aren't doing any actual work to create an environment that is diverse, that is inclusive, that does make people feel like they belong. And what we're talking about in this week is the fact that the systemic racism, yes, it's an infrastructural thing, but the most powerful weapon, what's the most powerful thing in the world, guys? What is the most powerful weapon we all have in our toolbox to be successful? 
What is our most powerful tool, our most powerful weapon? If you guys are with me right now, comment, let me know, what is our most powerful weapon as people in this world? If we want to be successful, if we want to be great, what is the most powerful tool we have at our disposal? Right? And if you guys are with me and you guys understand where we're going with this, please take a second and like the video. Let me know I'm on the right path. So I know where we're at and I'm not like, I haven't lost you guys, right, in the, in, the, in, the, in the shuffle. And Herschel, one of my students, says it right, right? Our most powerful tool, our most powerful weapon is our mind. It is absolutely our mind. And what we don't understand, right, what we don't grasp is that racism, discrimination, microaggressions, all these little things, people poking at you. What they're doing is they're getting in your mind and they're making your mind, which is your biggest tool, your biggest weapon, they're turning your mind against yourself. How many of you guys lack confidence in your educational track? How many of you guys lack confidence in your ability, in your capability to become a doctor? How many of you guys doubt yourself on a daily basis? How many of you guys are your own worst critic and every single day you pick at yourself and you pick at yourself and you pick at yourself over and over again and find all the reasons you can't be successful. Think about it, guys, right? Taylor knows knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave, but how many of you guys are a slave to that negativity? Think about this, guys. How many of you guys are in that mindset where you don't believe in yourself, you doubt yourself so hard, and then when you ask yourself why, you're doubting yourself why you can't be successful. You say, it's just, it's just me. I don't, I don't have what it takes. As we talked about yesterday, right? People were talking about how their professors were telling them they don't have what it takes. They don't have what it takes. They aren't enough. They aren't sufficient. And what we fail to recognize is the connection between our environment, the people around us, the infrastructure that drills this into our heads, and the conversation we have about ourselves. Right. Every single time someone tells you you're not a real black person, you're not a real Latina. When they tell you that you don't have what it takes, you don't have the right look, you don't talk the right way, you don't come from the right background, your parents didn't go to college, you can't be a doctor. When they tell you these things, all of these students of color are internalizing that, guys are internalizing that. And it leads them to a point, and we're gonna talk about some of these stories this week, to when they, even if they do get to college, and they are pre-med, where's the big time that pre-meds fall off the curve? Where do pre-meds and students of color, they're pre-med, where do they fall off the curve? Let's talk about it, where do they fall off the curve? Natalie, I like to see that, right? Being in the negative mindset, but trying to change, trying to get better. And we got to work at it. We got to work at it. But where do pre-meds, where do minorities in higher education, where do they fall off? There we go. Surex Streets had the correct answer. It's first semester and it's first year of college. Right? We all know what Azar just said. It. First semester and freshman year that's where students of color, that's where minorities fall off. And the question becomes, why do they fall off at that point? Why? Because they go in, as I went into college, feeding into the hype that I don't fit in, I don't look at other people, I'm not the same as them, I'm not people, I'm not smart like them, I don't have researchers like them, I don't have parents who have been here, I don't have it. And then when you hit that first stumble, boom, that first speed bump, what don't you guys have? What don't our students of color have? They don't have the mental fortitude. They don't have the mental belief, the self-confidence to say, hey, it's just a speed bump. This struggle is part of the process. I am capable of overcoming this. I am capable of getting through this. I can be successful. And so they do what? Change their major. They transfer out. They drop out. They don't 
become pre-med anymore. They fall into something else. They can't even overcome the first speed bump. And where does that come from? From being told consistently, persistently throughout their journey, they're not a real black person. You're faking it right now. <laughs> that ain't you, right? That intelligent person talking all proper, knowing words, dressing professionally. It's not you. Let your real self out. You're the ghetto hoedown. Be that person. That's you. This ain't you right now. You faking it. <laughs> and so we talk about imposter syndrome. Where does that come from? From being told you're an imposter through your whole journey. In incidents like this, whether it's telling you you're an imposter or subvertly telling you you're an imposter. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So my courses, right? I always have a big mindset component where I'm trying to fortify, trying to eradicate the negative feelings you have, the negative emotions, the lack of confidence, the extreme doubt you have. I'm trying to take that from a place of doubt to a place of confidence and then give you the skills and the tools to be certain and to, and to know you can execute. But I have to first attack you telling yourself that you're not a great student. You telling yourself that you can't get into medical school. You telling yourself that you are someone who's ghetto. You are someone who's incapable. You are, no guys, you are who you choose to be. And what real black means is what you make it. You are the image of blackness, however that is, and you choose it. But we have to first understand that people in this system, this racism and discrimination that we experience is going to pick at your self-esteem. And we have to work to build that and build capability and build young students of color's confidence that they are math-minded, that they are STEM-capable, that they are future doctors, dentists. And that's why I think it's beautiful that people are on social media, student, people of color who are saying, listen, I come from where you come from. I am from that neighborhood. I am from that street. I know exactly where you're at. But I got you. I made it. You can make it too, just like me. I think that's beautiful. Right? That we're trying to reverse that. That's what we're trying to do. But it's hard when you see someone online, but then when you're in your environment every day, you're there alone, right? You're behind enemy lines. And people telling you that you aren't enough, you aren't sufficient, you aren't capable. Does that make sense to everybody? And Carla asked, how can we help other students of color change their mindsets? And again, this is going to be an unpopular opinion. Too many people are following what I call the C1B1 model. Does anybody know what the C1B1 model is? I'll ask. C1B1. This is when we have students you're a student of color, you're a peer counselor, you're a peer tutor. And someone's struggling and you say, hey, listen, you'll be fine. I can do it. You can do it. And that's what you say. Hey, I got through it. You'll get through it. And we stop right there. See me, be me. C1, B1 model. You guys understand what I'm saying right now? See me, be me. Hey, I'm a doctor. I'm an anesthesiologist. You can be an anesthesiologist and a doctor. Go be it. And we stop. We gotta take the extra step, as Carl was pointing out. We gotta take the time, and I know we're busy. And we talked yesterday, I think it was Jay was talking about the pressure, right, you're the only minority, you feel the pressure to keep running to be perfect. But sometimes we have to recognize when we are achieving, when we are succeeding, it's important that we take time, not just to say, see me, be me, but to show me. Show these students what it took Right? Oh yeah, I was where you were and now I'm successful. Well, what's the gap? How did you change your mindset? How did you have more confidence? And for me, I tell all my students, you guys want to build confidence? It's baby steps, y'all. Small successes, small victories. I say every day I set two goals and I'm, I, 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 I rack up wins every day. Learn something new, teach something. Learn something new and teach somebody something. And if I do that every single day, it's a victory. When I was in college, you know what I wanted to do when I wanted to turn my academics around? Small victories. It wasn't getting an A. It was, hey, every day that I study when I'm supposed to study, that's a win. So when I go out and I do a seminar and I talk to students, the first thing is, hey, consistency. 
Don't try to get grades. Don't worry about that. Just get consistent with your studying. Simple. Think about that. How many of you guys, if you were just consistent, how much better would your grades be? You were studying every week, every day. How much better would your grades be? Truthfully. So I say, hey, just get consistent. Make every day a win. Doesn't have to be great studying. Doesn't have to lead to an A. Can you just study when you're supposed to study? Can you just get consistent? And I start there. And then I say, okay, now to get consistent, here's what I do. And I follow all these steps. I'm going to break it down. And I teach them five pillars. But just get consistent. First consistent. Then skilled consistency. Right? Then sustained skilled consistency. That's it. This would be straight A students. Consistency. High skill consistency. Sustained high skill consistency. That's it, baby. It's that simple. So we have to get past the see me, be me, and get to the show me, where we are providing resources. And I was just having this conversation today um, with one of the heads. You guys know I'm at UCSD, and I was talking uh, to one of the lead educators who's a bridge between the School of Medicine um, and the hospital, and they do a lot of simulation with medical students, and they do a lot of different things, and they were saying that working with medical students, one of the challenges, and they're like, man, I just don't understand, and this is, this is a, stu a person of color, right? And they're, they're not black, right? But they're a person of color. And they were saying, like, man, it, it really pains me because we get these medical students who come through and we do a great job of getting certain students in to our medical school, to our undergrad. But we just got a letter. And so through all this, like, if you guys don't know, UCSD had a big, like, protest. It was a big medical protest yesterday. And it was, I'm, I'm so proud, and I, I apologize, I forget her name. The head of SNMA, or the head of, the Black Student Union, one of the two, I apologize again. Um, but she wrote a beautiful letter to the dean, to the chancellors, to the counselors, to everyone throughout the medical school, all kind of levels, writing a letter of the demands and the requests that the black students have to make UCSD a more hospitable environment, a more comfortable environment, more welcoming environment, and a more supportive environment for black students. And so this letter was amazingly written. It was all these different things. But one of the things that this student mentioned was resources. And it was funny because the this person who's one of these educators was like, yeah, when I read that, I didn't understand what they meant by resources. Like we have a center and we have a lot. I'm like, what good is an empty building without the teaching, without the show me aspect, right? Assigning them a, a mentor who's a physician and students are texting me right, texting me right now. <laughs> Don't text me your messages, your stories right now. You can text me before we start. Um, but was requesting and didn't understand what that gap was. And I said, well, resources, an empty building is just an empty building. It doesn't facilitate learning unless there's someone there to teach. So if you have people who don't have the study skills, who don't have the test taking skills, right? That's why I'm working, right? I'm doing two presentations the next month for medical school. I'm doing one for first year students who are just starting their journey into medical school at one of these medical schools. And then I'm also doing a second year class at a different medical school talking about how do you succeed the second year academically? And this is a resource, right? I'm providing them resources, instructions, and showing them, okay, listen, here's how you succeed in medical school. Here are the steps that it takes to get a great step one score, to do well in your classes, to not be overwhelmed by the fire hose that is medical school. These are the steps. And so when the student was asking for resources for these black students, that's what they were asking for. But the disconnect was these educators didn't understand what that was. And that's the gap and that's the separator. So that was a long point to talk about what we're talking about. But I was really proud of this letter and the way it was written. Um, beautiful, like, black woman speaking out on this. It was, it was phenomenal to see that letter. I was really, really proud of that. So that's what we're talking about, Carla. So that's how we go from this place. We have to understand we have to, A, try to remove, right? And this is where this cultural competency, this is where this training, this is where being anti-racist, they want to say whatever, but whatever it is, an advocate. If you're in a group, and even though you may not be offended, if someone says something that is racist, that is discriminatory, and you know it, and you don't say something, then you're part of the problem. Because you're allowing, right? You're allowing an environment that is not inclusive to persist so we have to right people talk about we don't need allies we do need allies in this movement guys we need people of all colors and backgrounds 
to stand up and say racism, discrimination, it's not funny. It's not funny. It's not, it's not appealing. It's not cute. I won't allow it. And I'm going to stand up to it to create an environment where this black student doesn't have to hear that they're not a real black person. They're going to have an ally in me and someone that makes them feel like they belong. So there, getting these students resources and then going beyond just show me, be me, or sorry, <laughs> see me, be me to show me. Yeah. We got to go beyond mentorship to teaching. Everybody still with me? All right. So we're going to wrap things up, but we're going to continue to move through this. And I apologize. I didn't get to anybody's story tonight because I got, I got to talking. <laughs> um, but tomorrow we're going to continue our journey. And I'm debating whether we should go all the way back to elementary school. And I'll break down some elementary school stuff. because I got some really good people sent me some amazing elementary school uh, stories of systemic racism. So maybe we'll do that tomorrow or we'll either do that or do college racism. Yes. All right. If you guys enjoyed this video, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Like I said, we're going to be live all week, approximately 5 p.m. depending on when I got off work. I just got off work a little late today, um, so I'm here now. But we'll be around 5 o'clock. Uh, tell a friend. We're talking about systemic racism in education. We're talking about incidents. We're just doing story sharing. sharing. I apologize I didn't share more people's stories today, but I will tomorrow um, at 5 o'clock. And if you guys um, are enjoying this, it's your first time with me. Some people's first time catching me live. Subscribe, turn on live notifications so you guys can get on here um, and get at me. And yes, I will be having the guests, but we're going to spread those out. We're going to start with our guests next week, doing one guest a week. I'm going to bring on uh, black physicians, black educators, and we're going to talk about uh, racism and education and medical education in particular um, over the next six, seven weeks ish in that range. Yeah, if you want to send stories, guys, get to my website, studenttransformation.com. Um, you can get to my contact page and send me an email. That's the best way to reach me. Thank you guys so much. Uh, the website, like I said, studenttransformation.com. If you want someone to show you how to get it done, you guys can check it out there. Um, thank you guys for joining me. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Later. Today is the day, guys. No more excuses. No more complaining. You're going to take your future in your own hands. You're going to dominate. You're going to be successful. Get to my website, studenttransformation.com. I challenge you. What are you going to do today to make your life better?